We're on session 12 of Paths to Walk In. And I want to start out in Ephesians chapter 6. And today I'm going to uh, try my best to wax both apostolic and pastoral. And I'm just going to kind of share some things and just really try to be real uh, this morning and some of the things that, uh, that I'm going to be sharing. You know, one of the things in, early on in my training as a minister that I was taught was you never show vulnerability from the pulpit. And that's really a farce. Did you know that? Because people walk around, I mean, when you have the anointing on, you kind of feel like you got a Superman thing blazed up on your chest that you could leap tall buildings in a single bound, more powerful than a locomotive, and then by the time you get out to the car after you preach, you can't hardly get the car door open, you know, it's, it's kind of like that, and, and so I, I, in my training, you, you never show vulnerability, and uh, the Apostle Paul did. He shared about his thorn in the flesh, he shared about different things, and I want us to see what he says here in Ephesians six eighteen and 19, praying with all praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. And for me, that utterance may be given unto me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel. Now, there are times in my life I can identify with the Apostle Paul, and I'm not necessarily talking about his brilliance, but uh, because I can no way have the, the, the brilliance of the Apostle Paul. I mean, he is, he is the rabbi of rabbis. But I, I see the challenge because I really feel the need for others to intercede that I can actually communicate what God's put in my heart. I think that every minister deals with these feelings and the reality of their own inadequacies and communicative skills and sharing what God has revealed to them. When the infinite begins to blow into the finite. There's problems, isn't there? It's like, it's like you're trying to pour an endless ocean through an eyedropper. And I, I think anyone that has ever really begun hearing from God and, and trying to uh, mount the daunting task of taking the revelation that God gives us, and we're trying to pl- pour it through the matrix of our own soul. And the matrix of that soul, I mean, there's a plethora of things within our soul. We have our, our own concepts, our own history, our own wounds, our own peculiarities, and I seem to have a passel of them. All of us, we're we're trying to pour through those things and yet trying to stay true with what God reveals to us. And, uh, you know, I I tell Mary, sometimes I'm I'm very frustrated with me in that uh, I can sit and I can pray and God begins to open up things to me. it's, It's like he can peel back the mysteries of the universe and then when I try to convey them from the pulpit, uh, guys, I never walk away after editing a video not feeling disappointed in the preacher behind the pulpit. Because it, 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 it becomes a pale shadow of the depth of what God has given me. And then you have Mike Lake to deal with. Come on now. Because I, I mean, no, each one of us in our family lines, we, we have gifts that are good and we have gifts that we work the rest of our lives overcoming. And my mom will tell you the same thing on the savage line. We have a gift that we can say the right thing but say it the wrong way and not even have a clue we did it. That if, there, if there's any way possible of saying something that's truth and making it as a, we can say hello on the phone and make somebody offended and not have a clue we did it. And so uh, 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 my, my wife can testify. Uh, she, she used to get after me after I preached and, and brought me to tears, not because of her getting after me, but the realization that I was trying to communicate God's truth and I did it so offensively that anybody would have rejected it. And I'm thinking, God, surely there's, a, there's somebody else in the wings that you can bring in that doesn't have, because if, my, my problem is I'll, I'll go through things a thousand times in my head as, as I'm hashing out the theology and I, and I got the notes all lined out here so that I know how to convey things. My problem is when I get off my notes and I just get excited, and when you do that and you end up kicking into default, well, my default is I can say something perfectly wonderful and make it absolutely horrible with the way I express it. And so, guys, uh, with, with all this going through my head, and many times even when I'm preaching here, a lot of times the things I'm addressing aren't even here. I get calls and I get emails all week uh, from people across the body of Christ. Some are, 
are, are new to Hebraic heritage, some that wouldn't know Hebraic heritage if you hit them upside the head with it, they're just struggling within their Baptist church or their, or their Pentecostal church. And uh, all these things are going through my head as I'm preaching. Well, this can kind of connect to this, and maybe if they watch the video, it will help. And uh, guys, if I have ever said anything that has ever offended you, forgive me. There's a reason that I have a size 15 shoe, because it fits in my mouth quite easily, okay? And, and I really try to stick my notes, so I, I covet your prayers, because what we're trying to teach is so, is so important, not because of Mike Lake, but because I listen, and it's the one I'm, who I'm listening to. And the one thing that I have got right, I have enough sense to listen. So with, with that said... Let's go into uh, Genesis chapter 3 and verse 8 because I really want to deal this morning and I want to do it in a, in a delicate way because the, the minute in some of these issues you begin dealing with, it's easy to get offended and since I have the propensity to offend people, I want to be able to dance around that landmine this morning. But I, I want to bring something out that, that we always miss in Genesis 3.8. Now, Genesis 3, 8, to bring you up, they, the serpent came, they ate the fruit, and then God shows up. And so we, we really interpret most of, of Genesis 3, 8 is God showed up, man and the serpent, and Eve got their comeuppance. But we miss a very vital key of why Lucifer was so desperate to get him to mess things up. And it says, and they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. It was the habit of God to walk with man. I want you to, you, you see, that's the most dangerous thing as far as, as Lucifer is concerned is somebody walking with God. Not going through the motions, not putting on an air of religiosity, but somebody actually walking with God. Well, and this is whether they understand their Hebraic heritage or not. How many know there have been men of God that were Baptists like Spurgeon that made a great impact on the earth? There were men that were Pentecostal that didn't understand the Sabbath, didn't understand the feast, like Lester Sumrall, Smith Wigglesworth, and those. You know what, you know what, this, what made them so distinctive is they walked with God, and they were walking in the light of what they knew while they were walking with God. And they did it in, in such a way that it began to impact the world. And Lucifer knew that the most dangerous thing was that men we're beginning to walk with God. And in fact, if you, what, what separated David from many of the other kings of Israel? He walked with God. What separated Abraham from everybody else in Babylon? He answered the call to come walk with God. What separated Enoch? I mean, Enoch is plain. All we know is that he walked with God. And it was so awesome, God said, I'm going to have to pull you out to bring you back later because nobody can walk out what you walk out. And I, I don't, and you know, can you imagine I, I, I really, Enoch really blows me away, although there's, there's only, the Bible says an Enoch walked with God, and because Enoch walked with God, God took him, and Enoch was not. So he just kept on, he just, he just kept on walking, and just walked right out, outside our dimensional reality. But can you imagine in all of human history that with what God's going to do in the book of Revelation, God had to say, you know what, you're a man outside of time. Your walk is so essential that I've got to pull you out to bring you back because there's no one else is going to walk with me the way that you walked with me that will be able to do the miracles and to stay online with me the way that you have. Could you imagine that? To me, that's almost, that's almost incomprehensible, isn't it? And that's what he was afraid of. Now, we need to understand that we've already dealt with how in the garden that God gave man, uh, man commandments and those commandments were given to release authority. And we know that you know, the devil came and he stole that authority, but that was one of the byproducts that he was after. It wasn't the main product that he was after. Before the fall, why was Adam given the commandments? To release power, provision, and protection. Now, how many have seen people that come to church or a synagogue that have no power, provision, or protection. I want to answer that quandary today. It's because if you get your walk right, God will straighten out the rest. And what we, we end up doing is we do everything but the walk. Because the walk's what you do after you leave. 
It's what you do 24-7. Guys, I've had to come to the quandary that uh, yet today we have many trying to walk the commandments of God, but we don't see no power. We don't see no protection. We don't, we don't see anything in their lives except that they're, they now look Jewish. That's it. And we can say the same thing for the charismatic church. You see, the, 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 there used to be a time that within the Baptist church, the men that were behind the pulpit preached the cross so powerfully that if a sinner came in, they were brought to their knees. We don't have that anymore. We used to have men in the charismatic circles, the Pentecostal circles, that the power of God would fall to such a degree that demons would run from, not to, that miracles, and you didn't have to do a gimmick to get a miracle, the miracles just began happening. You didn't have to work up anything in the flesh, it just began, and, and the charismatic movement is now, uh, has went from being birthed in the power of the Holy Spirit, guys, that there's a lot going on right now, the charismatic movement that is occultism, and witches have come in and taken over a lot of segments, and I've actually uh, found articles from witches that are braggadocious about it. They brag about it. We come in, and they just, they just let it, you know, you know, a witch can come into a charismatic circle and speak Enotian, which is one of the, which is a perversion of one of their languages. They call it Enotian, but how I many know Enoch didn't speak it? But the, it, it's a magic ritual thing, and they're actually speaking curses over the congregation. The congregation thinks they're speaking in tongues, and there are charismatic churches that let anybody lay hands on anybody. And so that witch, while they were involved in all the, the occult rituals, work up an anointing that they're transferring to people in the church. With, and so you have all this craziness go on. And they call that church. Because somehow or another, we, we have missed the point of it's the walk. But what I have found, guys, is that uh, there are some propensities in us that we need to address. That is universal among all churches, whether you're a Messianic synagogue, whether you're a Baptist church, a Pentecostal church. I've been preaching since I was 13 years old. In fact, I surrendered to preach on my 13th birthday, so it was my bar mitzvah. Didn't even know what that was back then. And with the Missionary Baptist Association up in St. Louis, one of the things they began doing, because they had so many young men begin to surrender to ministry, is they would get us together once a month, and they would teach us how to not act like fools as we're trying to prepare for ministry. They, they, they taught us how to do a sermon. By the time I was 14, I knew how to, how to properly do a four, a four or five point sermon. I knew how to deliver it in 20 minutes. And how I many know I've completely forgotten that since then? Uh, they also taught me how to dress. And they, they began to teach us protocols for functioning within the Baptist church. And how many know that the protocols are different in a missionary Baptist church than they are in the American Baptist church or within the Southern Baptist church? In other words, each church has its own culture. That, that's very important to understand. Each church has its own culture, and it, it, it's very diverse. I, I have noticed that because uh, I'm, I'm very sensitive when I travel and I go into a church, I, I try to find out what the culture is because I'm, I'm already bad enough sticking my foot in my mouth with being offensive if I don't think through things. I don't want to compound that with, with complicating cultural issues. It's like the, w the way that I'm dressed today, and I mean, it, it's like 100 degrees outside. Normally, I wear a short sleeve shirt. Did you know that my attire and even having a beard, I could not preach in many churches because not that it's against the word, it's against the culture of that church. I mean, I don't, I don't have a tie. I got a whole closet full of ties. Guys, I don't like them. <laughs> I, I got jackets, and I do wear them in the, in, the, in the wintertime. It's too hot in the summertime because they hide the girth, at least a little bit on video. You know, you think you're about like this, and you watch yourself on video, and you find out you're about like this, you know. Um, but I, I, couldn't, I couldn't preach in them. I, I remember one time. I went up to uh, New England, and I was getting ready to preach at a church, and it was back in the 90s where they had the, uh, the band collar dress shirts. Remember that when those came out? They're still, still very popular in some areas, and I was very tickled. I, I'd gotten a blue stri a white stripe one and a black one 
that are normally, well, they were like $120, $130 shirts back in the 90s, and I got them for $35. They were on clearance, and I thought, man, I am dressed to the T. I'm, I'm, I'm jamming. So I had, you know, gray slacks, this, this blue and white striped shirt, and a real nice blue blazer, and they're all praising and worshiping, and the bishop pulls me over and begins to rebuke me for my shirt. I mean, it, it was a, I mean, it came down, had the double fold. I actually had to go buy cufflinks to put on them. I thought, I thought man, I, I'm uptown. And he was telling me how I was downtown, not uptown. And really, he said, now, if you're one of my people, I, I, would, I would set you down and not even let you speak, but since you're a guest speaker. And about the time he said that, his mentor and his entourage came in in a church three times the size. And to show you the humor of God, they were all wearing band collar shirts. <laughs> None of them are wearing ties. But, but you can see how that you can be judged by that. And so, there, and guy, within so the Baptist churches, there'll be different protocols. I mean, I, I've preached in Baptist churches. I've preached in Methodist churches. I, I have uh, preached in Messianic and Hebraic and Charismatic and Crazymatic and Pentecostal. White Pentecostal, black Pentecostal. How many know that there are differences between a white Pentecostal church and a black Pentecostal church? And sometimes even the, the ways that we respond to the Holy Spirit are culturally based. You learn them in church. And it's not that the Holy Spirit isn't moving. It's this, you're, you're taught that the Holy Spirit isn't moving unless you, you know. Years ago, and, and this was still when I was at Fort Leonard Wood, and we were at a prayer meeting, and the guy was just teaching me some things. And, and I mean, the anointing of God was so strong on me, I swear it, it took paint off a wall. And we had a group of people, you know, we're all praying, and God says, go lay hands on every one of them, I'm going to show you something. Some just fell out of the power of God, some just started crying. You know, we, we don't have any criers around here that when the presence of God comes in, you know. You know, some of us have our own designated boxes of Kleenex. And, and some of, one guy started spinning, and one guy literally became like Daffy Duck. <laughs> Now, years later, Mary and I found out what that was. There was a demon responding, and then we lay, years later found that out and cast it out. But, but every person reacted to the Holy Spirit differently. You know, the last thing you want to do is lay hands on them and go, get off me. You know, then you know that church needs to be a little bit different that session. But a lot of times on, on the, the different ways, you know, that people say, oh, I feel the Holy Ghost. Can you see the Apostle Paul? And the Apostle Paul just stood and went, I feel the Holy Ghost, and, and them trying to articulate in that book of Acts. You don't see that. Now, is that really improper? No, it's just the way that the culture expresses the presence of God. And sometimes some cultures are good. How many know that within the Hispanic culture that their, their centeredness on family is really important? And I, I, I think that with some of the things that the liberals are doing today, they're going to have real problems with the Hispanic community because before politics in the Hispanic community, there's family. Okay. And what I love about the black community, guys, they know how to praise God. And if you ever want to see a group of people tear a church apart with praise, let them have a hard time that week. Now, a white person coming in, I've had a bad week, I can't praise. You know, it, come on, I'm white, I can say this. Oh, oh no, I got no praise God about. You have a black church go through a rough time, they will tear that church apart. They will literally tear the roof off that church because they know that if they can get in the presence of God with praise, God can restore them of the wounds. They learned how to praise in insufferable times. Even during the, the, the 60s when we, we had uh, such prejudice against the black people and threats on their lives, sometimes they'd actually have their churches bombed. They'd get in those churches and they would praise God till the sun went down. How many know that we need to learn from that? So there are some, there are some good things about differences in culture. In fact, in Revelation, we find that God says, you know, when, when we see a picture here, and let's look at this, Revelations 8 uh, 5, 8 through 10. Because we signed it, kind of see a glimpse of, of heaven. I, 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 sometimes I get so excited about Jesus being found worthy to, to open up the book and to get the book that I, forget, I, I don't see a lot of other things. But I want to show you something here. And when he had taken the book, the four beasts and the four and twenty elders fell down before the Lamb, having every one of them harps and, and golden vials full of, old, of odors, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof. For thou wert slain and hath redeemed us by thy blood out of what? Every kindred, 
every tongue, every people, and every nation. That word nation is ethnos in the Greek, every ethnic group. And so it has made us all kings and priests unto our God. So there, there, there are going to be elements of our various authenticity that is going to be able to find redeemed expression in worshiping God. And so as, as, as I deal with these things, I do, not want to, uh, I do not want to put down things that are biblical, but at the same time, what we've got to realize that as we uh, understand the full counsel of what God is giving, we've got to look at our cultural things and make sure none of them violate the word. Because there, there, are, there are several propensities that we have that are, that are where culture can be great. There are some conundrums of culture. The first one, over time, culture can drift and needs correction. Have we seen the culture drift in America? My, oh my, oh my. And even besides the, the Christian moorings of this nation, there was a time in America that there were two driving forces in this nation, morals and then commerce. And it, it went in that order because if you couldn't do commerce morally, people wouldn't buy from you. And about the 1900s, we, we lost our morality, and then people were being abused in the workplace, and we saw the development of unions. But where Jesus is not the center of things, how many know things can get corrupted? And so government's corrupted, unions are corrupted, the marketplace is corrupted. And so now everything is about capitalism. It's even, even the, 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 the liberals that are bad on, on capitalism, they still promote capitalism in their own way as long as it's for their own agenda. And now the culture in America is everything is driven by capitalism. And there are several pagan holidays that drive capitalism in America. That if you did not have these, that every corporation, every store in America would close down. First one's Valentine's Day. Halloween. Christmas and Easter. You take those away, you take about 80% of all commerce in America that people will get stupid and spend money that they don't have on things they don't need during those holidays. And so a lot of the resistance that we feel as we address these things, it, it, it is culturally based because it, it, it begins to, to uh, our, our, our own culture in America is now based upon money. And we, we've actually seen some movements in the, in, in the church that are all about money. God is the God of money, and if you have a lot of money, that proves that you walk with God. That may preach real well in America, but try that in Indonesia. Can, can you see the, the fallback? And so cultures can drift. And we see throughout the Word of God, even within the Jewish people or the, the nation of Israel, that they had ebbs and flows in their culture, that they, they had a propensity to allow that culture to drift, and they begin to drift away from God. And we've seen every denomination do it. Did you know that when you read the writings of Charles Wesley, his greatest nightmare has come to pass with the Methodist Church? Did you know that? He said, he said, my fear is not that the Methodist Church would cease to exist, but that would have become a pale, anemic organization like all the other churches have become. That's, that was his greatest fear. And to a, a great degree, it's come to pass. I've stood, in, I've stood in Methodist pulpits and had the elders of the church get mad at me for preaching a sermon that was penned by John Wesley. And I'd, I'd always wait till their, till their faces got so bright red that I thought they were going to have an aneurysm or a stroke. And I'd say, oh, by the way, this is from uh, John Wesley. He preached on such and such a date, and it's from this volume. And you can see them go, Pfft. And I, I would really try hard to, to not get Mike Lake in there and really up to that point just try to stick with John Wesley, <laughs> you know. I'm saying, here's the founder of, of, of your movement, and you're, you're getting mad. Have you not drifted? But here's one of the most dangerous ones. Well, look, look, before I get to that, one of, the, one of the problems that we have is as culture drifts, it seems within the heart of man that he will fight harder for his cultural beliefs than his biblical ones. And even when the culture gets off, Man will fight for his cultural drift. That's why Isaiah had resistance. That's why Nehemiah had resistance. That's why Ezekiel had resistance. Even with the people of God, he was pointing them back to that which God had established. It just didn't agree with the cultural drift that they had done. 
And we're seeing the same thing with ministers and prophets today. We're seeing men and women of God, whether they're Baptists all the way to the Messianic movement, that are trying to bring correction but that correction, they're finding resistance, not because it doesn't agree with the word. It doesn't agree with the established culture within those movements and how they have drifted. So we've got to be real sensitive about that and say, God, it needs to be more than culture. The second thing I, I think is, is really important, that culture does not equal a walk with God. Because what I've seen, guys, is as that culture is developed you can get a guy start coming to church, and if he wants to be there, he will adapt to that culture. Getting the culture down is easy. It really is. That's why we have Baptists that can be a very, very good Baptist, but not be a believer. That promoted, uh, that prompted, um, oh, what's the guy out in... Uh, he wrote the gospel according to Jesus, um, McCarthy. In his book he wrote, he said, the problem with Baptists is 92% of them aren't saved. What prompted that? Because they are culturally Baptists. We have culturally Pentecostals and Charismatics that aren't filled with the Holy Spirit but speak in other tongues because you can learn how to speak in other tongues. There are actually cults out there that say, repeat this after me, and they actually have classes on how to speak in other tongues. Anybody can run die, shan die, catch you. But there's no other fruit of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. There's no power. There's no hunger for the Word. There's no hunger for the presence of God. There's, there's no hunger for holiness. Those, those were all byproducts of the baptism in the Holy Spirit, yet we see uh, over, the, over the, the, the whole width of the charismatic movement, there are very few that have that. Let's look at the, the faith movement. When you look at Lester Summerall or Smith Wigglesworth, these people walked with God and uncompromisingly walked with God. I mean, they stared down devils. They stared down witch doctors. They, I mean, this, Lester Summerall, has, when he, he was ministering in Africa, and this demonic spirit came and began to shake his bed while he was in it and shook it into the middle of the room, and he cast the demon out, and he sat there for a minute and said, Get back here. Put it back. The bed was in that corner when you got in here. Put it back, then leave. That thing came, shook the bed back into the corner, and left. How many know that that takes a man walking with God? Or the time John, you know, people read with Smith Wigglesworth, you know, the, the, the brother fought kidney stones. Now, he could raise people from the dead, but he fought kidney stones. And there were many times that uh, while, while he was out traveling that he almost became anemic because he lost so much blood trying to pass kidney stones. And th there's a story of this kid was, can you imagine being like 20, 21 years old and you're supposed to drive around Smith Wigglesworth? Okay, that, that's your job in the church. And Smith is praying and he, he is literally rocking in pain so bad that the, the guy can't even hardly keep the thing on the road. And so he's thinking, this old man's going to die on me. And everybody's going to say, I killed Miss Smith Wigglesworth. And so he pulls over and opens the door and says, Brother Wigglesworth, do we need to go to the hospital? Smith stands still, looks up and says, well, are you sick? <laughs> because he had determined that God was going to be his only healer. And you see men that walked with God like that. And now within the faith movement, we end up with, a pale comparison because people have learned the lingo. They, they, have, they have learned how to function. Uh, I've seen guys go in debt. You know, if you're going to function within that movement, you have to have a two or $3,000 suit and you have to have a Rolex. I've actually met men that borrowed money to go buy those things and they would keep the Rolex in the safe and just wear it when they went to church or whenever they ministered. Pale comparison. I, I can't see Smith Wigglesworth wearing a Rolex. I, I can see guys like them wearing more probably a Timex or whatever was on sale at Walmart that looked nice, that caught their fancy. But can you see how, and, and people can talk the talk, but they're not walking the walk. And you know how you can really tell? Because when the devil fluffs up stuff a little bit, they're the first ones to get afraid. It's, it's, there's, there's fluff, there's culture, and they can adapt to it. Let me, let me share a, a situation. I, and this is one of the guys, he, he never quite finished his bachelor's degree, but he was a friend with us and studied with us years and years ago. 
And uh, in fact, when I was pastoring at Santee, I came and had him preach for us. And uh, really liked him. We met his wife. Mary and I said, they got problems. <laughs> preach, he had pastored for over 20 years as a Baptist minister. Pastored over 20 years. Falls off the map for 15 years or more. He calls me and he says, Mike, I need to talk to you. And I said, why? And he said, well, he said, uh, he said my, you know, my wife left me and all kinds of crazy things went on with that. And he said, I got mad at God, began drinking and taking drugs. And he said, I found myself in jail. I mean, that, you know, Paul, his reason for being in jail would be a lot different than this fellow's. And th this is a guy that led people to Jesus that had pastored successfully for that many years. And he said, he said, I was crying out to God in jail and realized I was never saved. He was raised in church. He adapted to a culture. And he equated the culture with a walk. And really today, whether, whether you're dealing with a messianic movement or whether you're dealing with Baptist, the first thing they judge you on is not you being biblical. They judge you on how you correspond to that culture. Uh, guys, I mean... You know, most of us guys, or a few of us guys here, have facial hair. Did you know that if we start going to some Baptist churches, we'd have men and women praying and fasting for us to hear from God to shave our faces? Because that's unacceptable. If it, that, that, because it doesn't fit that mold. We didn't be able to buy a tie. We need, we need to pray for Brother Lake that he gets enough money to buy him a tie. I've got racks full of them. I don't like them. This is my pulpit, glory to God. <laughs> I don't have to. I just wear them when I travel because I don't want to offend other people. But can, can you see how that happens? And that will happen in, uh, I was sitting in a, in a black Pentecostal church. And I had already ministered. I had given a prophetic word. And they started a Jericho march. The Jericho march lasted longer than my sermon. Everybody here knows how long my sermons last. And so I'm sitting there, just minding myself, I'm worshiping God. I got tears just running down my face because this is the way this white boy just worships God and everything. And this one comes up to me and says, you need to get me doing that or you're not worshiping God. You'll get a victory if you go do what they do. Well, I have a different expression. I, I was at the place of just basking in his presence. And I'm, it's like she pulled me from the throne of God and told me, now, if you do what they do, you can get up to the throne. I was already there. But what I was doing as this white honky boy did not match. And was, was what they were doing wrong? No. How many know that you could have got through the throne of God with a, with a, with a Jericho march? Because that was the expression with their culture. She made the mistake of judging me spiritually based upon the application of their culture. Not knowing that I was at the same place. I may be, you know, they may have been a little bit closer to the throne. than I, I may have been sitting on daddy's lap for all she knows. I mean, it, it, it was just wonderful. It's like, I don't, I don't want church to end. I, I don't care. We'll, we'll, we'll dismiss all the people after Denny's where we're going to go. I don't care. We may, we may end up being the supper crowd instead of the lunch crowd. I don't care, God. This is just so good. And we see the same thing within the Hebraic Roots Movement. I mean, there, there are certain things that we do things because there's, there's a reason behind it. How many know that there, there are some really cool things about the Hebraic Roots Movement? I've got a drawer full of talitot. That's plural for talit. Okay? Or as you say, Missouri, I got me a bunch of talits. <laughs> I, I, and I use them in prayer. And I, when I travel, I'll take them and I will use them to teach because you can take a talit and you can teach Jesus from one thing to the other. It's all about him. And, and I love that. I love the shofar. There, there's aspects that I really love. But you know that you can use all that and not walk with God. You really can. And I, I've had people that have been invited into some different Hebraic heritage conferences that walked away very put off. Uh, one guy wrote me and he, he said, he goes, I was so excited to come in. And uh, he said, uh, he said I, I attended it. And he said, all these guys put on their talits. And he said, it more resembled people putting on Superman capes. And said they began looking down at all the men who didn't have me. He said, he goes, I never heard of it. I went, I went to learn. 
And we, we've seen church cultures like that too, haven't we? That there are some church cultures that make you so welcome when you come in. And some, they, they want to examine you and shake out your pockets and see what's there for they even think they're going to let you in the front door. And it, it kind of goes with that. Because they were judged upon how Jewish you looked rather than just coming and wanting to learn about the Word of God. We've seen that. I've also been told of stories of, of people that uh, had their shofar and their talit, but the demon still ran them out of the house. Because, you know, it, it, it doesn't, the, the devil doesn't care. I mean, you can have an heirloom quality. Yes, there are heirloom quality talits out there. I've got one. They're heirloom quality. That means it's, it's such a high quality and handmade, not done on a machine somewhere, but handmade. I've got ones that I've had the, the yeshiva boys at a rabbinical school in the Bronx tie the zitzi for me, okay? But, you know, you can, you can have the, the best of the best and all that, and the devil doesn't care. It's not going to chase off a devil. You can blow a shofar and it won't chase off a devil. You know what chases off a devil? The name of Jesus in any language. I've seen demons flee at the name of Jesus in English, in Hebrew, in Russian, in German, in Spanish, because it's every kindred, every tongue. And there is, a, there is an expression of the kingdom of God within that tongue of that individual. Sometimes we forget that. I've, I've had people come in and oh, how come I don't use Yeshua all the time? Well, I'm speaking in America, and I'm speaking mostly to Gentile folks. I have spoken at, at Messianic groups. When I do that, I, I adjust it for them because I think some of them have used, used Yeshua so long they forgot what Jesus was, you know. And so I, I've got to adjust that a little bit. But it's so easy, guys, to get so caught up with, with culture, even uh, because within the Jewish culture there are some good things, and they've drifted just like all of us have. And you've you got to sort that out. And the culture that I'm trying to build in biblical life isn't a messianic culture. It's a walk. Because that's where we're headed. It's a walk. Now that walk, you will find expressions of it uh, within the Baptist church, within the, the charismatic church. How many know there are messianic congregations that would never allow someone to speak in tongues because they don't believe in that? And yet there are, there are ones that are. I've had God wake up messianic rabbis and call me and said, I need someone to teach me spiritual warfare. Because that's one thing that we do know around here. I mean, when you have the occult come after you and you have assassins come after you, you learn spiritual warfare, Jack. And so those things we got down. And there are things that we can borrow from those various cultures that are biblical and have that expression, but we can't judge things based upon the outward appearance of a cultural standard. Because if we do that, we make the mistake of not understanding the power of the walk. Because we have, we have believers right now that are keeping the commandments that are walking in defeat. Have you guys realized that? There, there are people this weekend that are going to go in charismatic churches and they're going to shout the roof down. They're going to go roll on the floor. They're going to shake and scream and do anything within their cultural expression that they believe, you know, God may have moved in that once, but that doesn't mean God's going to move in it the same way, the same. Jesus very seldom ever ministered to the same person the same way. There's, there's going to be myriads of expression. And so what they think is they're, they're trying like to be like Samson. They're shaking themselves, but no power comes. Because they're, they're trying all these things, but yet they're going to walk away in defeat. We, we have pastors that are, that are frustrated, that are saying, boy, if things don't change, I'm going to close this thing down. Because we have been trained that numbers equals spiritual growth. So if you have a thousand people all going to hell, that's better than ten? Or how about... I would rather be like and have David's mighty men that you have 10, 15, 100 really walking with God that can hear God, that begin walking the ways of God. That when the devil shows up, he ends up being like we read in Psalms 91, the dragons underneath their feet. I want those kind of people because in the days that are coming, culture will get you killed if you're distrusting a culture alone. And I don't care if it's the Baptist culture or the Jewish culture, if it's culture alone, it does not have the spiritual power to back it up. 
if it's culture alone. You see, I want to be able to st stare down Hitler and have him under my feet. I want to be able to stare down Mussolini and have him under my feet. Culture alone isn't going to do it. It's the walk. And every single one of us are required. That's why the Apostle Paul said, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. You've got to learn to walk it out. You've got to learn to walk with God. And as you walk with God, the journey finally begins. That that is a journey to empowerment. It is a journey where the commandments not only make sense, but they have power behind them. I've seen people tithe and go bankrupt. I've also seen people tithe and get promotion after promotion after promotion after promotion. What's the difference? The walk is the difference. Because the walk began to position them for God to respond and add power to the commandments. When you start walking with God, the commandments begin to produce provision, empowerment, and protection. Without the walk, they don't. It just gives cultural uniformity. But culture is so much easier to mimic, isn't it? I find it fascinating to find people deep within the Ozarks that have never understood anything Hebraic or anything else, but they become an expert because they bought a talit and they got a shofar and they went to a seminar. The same way that I've read guys that get the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and see, there are a lot of Pentecostal churches, guys, that you can get saved last week, surrender to ministry this week, and they ordain you the next week. Because it's all about spirit. And they're now an expert. And the crazy things that go on, it's scary. I found myself... There, there are some colloquiums that Dr. John Garr has uh, had where he's brought in experts from all over the world on, on Jewish roots. How I ended up there, I don't know. Because the first time he brought me there was 92. And I didn't start doing anything Hebraically until about 95 to 97. God used that to introduce me. But I, I think he brought me in. For one thing, he said, Mike needs help. <laughs> um, him and I would used to have lunch together, and I'd have a bacon cheeseburger to prove my liberty in the Lord while he had his cheeseburger. Um, <laughs> I mean, old Mike Lake don't do that no more. But, but I, I look at some of the things that John had to put up with him, thinking he's probably shaking his head, just praying for him, saying, Lord, help him. But he brought me in, and people like Dwight Pryor and, and so many of these people, some of them have gone on to be with the Lord, that are world-renowned. They, they, they have not only the, the speaking. I mean, these are guys, whenever they go to Israel, that the University of Jerusalem hunts them down to come and lecture while they're there. Please, even, even if it's for an hour, just please come. These kind of guys. And they loved on me. And, 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 and remember, I'll tell you, the first time I came, I brought back almost, almost like a suitcase full of tapes and books they all had given me. Off there, you, you need this. Go read this. You'll like this, you know. And I actually come home, put it all on the shelf, and didn't pull it out until the witches start showing up. Um, but the last one I went to was... About 2001, I guess it was after we moved up here, and it was down in Arkansas. And the leading academians within, I mean, these were uh, people like Ariel Berkowitz was there and Dwight Pryor and many others. And by that time, I was, I was kind of up to code <laughs> and, and could understand. But one of the things that they were sharing is their concern over the Messianic movement on all of the um, heresy that's coming up all over the place because somebody, you know, they were, they, were, they were a heretic in the Pentecostal movement. Now they have a Talit and a Shofar and now they're keeping the feast and, and now they're doing it so offensively and so crazy. And, and, you know, they, they're actually doing more damage than good and that, that was part of that. That whole colloquium was us getting together and uh, this last magazine that John Gar, he actually put a special cover around it saying, these are the things that we believe, these are the truths that we affirm that need to be a part of, of any Hebraic group to keep orthodoxy. I mean, it's interesting when, when world leaders and, and experts within this field worldwide come together. I mean, they came as far as China for this thing in, in, in Arkansas and saying, we need to make sure that they need to have all these just to stay sound. 
It's because in all these things, there's no walk with the ones that are getting off. And, and Mary and I, over the years, we, we have, we have uh, I listen to tons and tons. I, I've, got, I've got over a terabyte hard drive just full of MP3 lectures from all kinds of guys that I listen to. And uh, Mary and I will start listening to some. Well, that's pretty good. And then you see them and they go, anybody ever see that? In, in, uh, I've seen it in the charismatic movement. I've seen it in the Baptist movement. The old joke in the Baptist is that, that Baptists don't increase by multiplication. They increase by division. Because where it used to be one Baptist church, now there are two, then there are four, then there are six, all in the same town sometimes. And, and so all the movements are, are, have that propensity. Because we get into culture, and we, we take our dysfunction out of one culture, and we bring it into another. Because what I, I guarantee you what I've seen a lot in, in the, the, the Messianic movement is you have a charismatic that was more of a crazy-matic that discovered their Hebraic heritage, now they have simply put a Jewish trend on the crazy things they used to do and used to teach in the charismatic church that got them ran off, but now they're doing it and they have a whole new audience. Those things begin to, uh, begin to be reduced when everybody learns how to walk with God for themselves. The greatest safeguard for me as a minister here is when you start walking with God. Because when you really start walking with God, it becomes apparent when Mike Lake gets off. And you begin praying for me and you'll see God correct me. But if none of them are walking with God and they all walk off a cliff, how many know that's a bad deal? And we see that so many times. Because we're, uh, I, want, I want us to go back now. We've been dealing with Romans chapter 5, 6, 7, and 8. I want to go back to Romans chapter 8 and I want to show you something out of this that is, is so important because I want us to keep balance and with biblical life, we have a different mission from God than starting to simply a charismatic fellowship or a messianic fellowship. We have a specific mandate of preparing the body for war. And are, 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 do you understand there's a war coming on the earth and not just war with guns, but there is a religious war coming on the earth. The pressure of it's already beginning to build in many areas. Some of it's even being facilitated by our own government. Some of the freedoms that we used to have, we don't have anymore, religiously. They have been slowly putting us in a box, in a box, in a box, in a box, in a smaller box, and then those that really walk with God, God's going to command us to knock the walls down. It's time for the walls to come down just like Jericho and for us to walk in the kingdom. But the Apostle Paul and all that he was sharing, we, we dealt with this last week. How many kind of understand uh, Romans 5, 6, 7, and 8 a little bit better now and that there were two laws and all the different things and those things I don't want to do but I find myself doing because there was another law working in me? And then we get to verse 13. He says, For if we live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if, if through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. And see, to be led by the Spirit means to be walking with the Spirit. It means to be walking with God. And we have a lot of people that claim to be Christians, but they're, and they say, well, I'm led by God. Well, then how come everything you hear from God doesn't mortify the deeds of the flesh? It increases them. No one's seen that, have they? Or, or is it just that I always get all the news about that, or have, has anybody else seen that? You sit in church, and, and God, will say, God will say, God told me to do this this week. And then the next week, no, God changed his mind as this. Then the next week, no, God changed his mind and it's this. And they end up being all over the place because they're blown about by every wind of doctrine. They're blown about by every feeling that the flesh has. One week they want to do this, and they think they're going to get attention from doing this. And then they do it, and well, it's not really enough attention. What well, gives more attention in the church? Because... For some of us, our bondage is, where am I trying to draw my self-worth from? All of them are a black hole that it can never be filled because it only takes the handprint of God to fill it. Only God's hand can fill it. Only the infinite can come. When God begins to put his hand on you and begins to walk with you, then your self-worth, the world can't take it away. The world can't give it. But they'll go from thing to thing to thing to thing. And what I have found about people that are walking with God, they're led by the Spirit, there's just a consistency. They just keep moving forward. They're not all over the place. I'm going to do this, and this is what God has me doing right now. Then they get a little bit better. I said, now to that, isn't that what the Apostle Peter said? To your faith, add this, to this, add this, to this, add this. 
And we have people that scrap everything and they try something new. Scrap everything and try something new. That's not following the Spirit of God. The Spirit of God knew where you needed to go before you needed, knew you needed to go. And he has you on a journey. He has you on a journey that you can throw away every weight that so easily besets you. Not only can you throw away weights, he begins having you pick things up. And in this journey, there is absolute consistency. I, I don't get excited anymore when I have people promise me a bunch of things and just gets all excited about things. Uh, guys, if I had one-tenth of the promises and pledges made to this ministry, we'd be sitting in a multi-million dollar building right now over the years. I anymore, I get shocked when somebody actually does it. And there are a few people that have really been supporting us that, that aren't even a part of this congregation. They get fed on the Internet. They get fed from the DVDs uh, that they outgive our giving because they, they see that it speaks into their lives. Uh, but really, out of, out of all the ones that have said they were going to do that in the past, I've got David's band of, of, of soldiers that are doing it, and they're making a difference. But what I want, what, what my heart is about is I know what's coming. If you don't walk with God, you don't make it. If you don't walk with God, you're going to end up bowing your knee to the Antichrist. Because you're, those cultures everybody is depending on will lean eventually in that direction because of external pressure. Just like they lean into other sins, they'll begin leaning into it. But it's those that are led by the Spirit of God that are walking with God that go back. Because everything the enemy's doing, the whole system of Babylon is about stopping you from walking with God. And within the church, we get real easily, we, we step away from that so that we can have church and walk with one another. And we have creeds up on the wall. If you want to walk with us, you've got to obey these. You've got to dress a certain way. You've got to act a certain way. Women can't cut their hair. Women, you know, men must cut their hair. Women can't cut their hair. Maybe they want them both to shave. I don't know. Uh, but, you know, all these different things. If you're going to walk with us, you must do this mold. But let me tell you something. That mold is going to be warped with the pressure that's coming. We see it. Guys, I was raised old line Baptist. Most Baptists today don't hold a candle to the old Baptist. Most of the charismatic Pentecostals don't hold a candle to the old Pentecostals and the old charismatics. They don't. Why? There's the drift. And if they, you know who, did God set that drift into motion? No. Because we're not walking with the Spirit and we're not mortifying the deeds of the flesh, we drift. When was the last time you heard a Christian say that God corrected them about something? Everybody's coming up about great revelations of how God's going to bless you. But no one brings up any correction. God, God knows that this is a generation. If any generation needed correction, we need correction. We need adjustments for the Holy Spirit to come and say, readjust. What God gave me prophetically, right now in the world, and this is while we were worshiping, God began to just talk with me. And he said, he said, you see several things right now in America, it's drought from one end to the other, isn't it? When you look on the map, everybody's having Texas and Arizona weather. I, I told Mary last night, I said, we're not supposed to have 30% humidity in the summertime. It's normally so humid you can't stand to walk out there. And it is now so dry, they had on the news, that people's foundations are beginning to shift horribly because the ground is, is so far down, it's so far, it's so far dry. Uh, Steffi had some visitors this week, family that uh, came up from uh, Oklahoma, said that guy had a backhoe, went down 15 feet, and never found any moist soil. That is alarming. And so we have that going on. In other parts of the world, we have that they have so much water, they can't contain it. And if they don't have the drought or have the mass water, they're having political upheaval. There's no spot on the planet that you can say, it's good there right now. Because God's trying to get our attention to show us things are out of order. That there, there's a darkness coming. And it is coming because we have allowed it because we have allowed sin to take hold. And everybody has their own cultures, but nobody's really walking with God. That's why God said, with their lips, they are they're talking like they serve me, but their hearts are far from me. 
And what God began to say is he said, I'm, be, I'm going to begin causing a contrast. One of the things, Mary, Mary and I know judgment's got to come. There are too many bad things going on in America and, and different parts of the world that God has got to judge. But what I have found hope for is that when God judged Egypt, there was a Goshen. When God judged the world, there was an ark. And God promised, he said, now he didn't say if the politicians who are called to Washington will humble themselves and pray. Fat chance of that. If the educators in Ivy League schools will humble themselves and pray. He said, if my people, if my people. Do you, do you guys claim to be his people this morning? Then it, it's time for us to humble ourselves and pray. And God, I want to turn from any wickedness in my life. If there's something that has creeped in, correct me. Correct me. I want Holy Ghost conviction in my life. That's, a, that's both an old Baptist and an old Pentecostal tradition. That there's something wrong if you don't get convicted by the Holy Ghost every once in a while. And churches used to be judged by the level of conviction they could bring on your heart. Now they're judged on whether they can bring enough goosebumps. We call them Holy Ghost goosebumps. Most of the time they're just flesh goosebumps. God's going to make me rich. Because what God is getting ready to do, there, there has to be a contrast. For, for people to see a need for Jesus, there has to be a contrast. That as we begin to seek God to repent, there was one time God judged Jerusalem. And he actually sent an angel to go forth with a pen, and he marked those that were grieved over the sins of the city. And once they were marked... God says, I can go ahead and judge the area, but I'll not touch those that are marked. See, if you're going to get a mark, might as well get that one, not the one of the beast. We need to allow the Holy Spirit to move through us that we can be grieved of the sins of our community, grieved of the sins of what's going on in our culture. And as we begin to pray, to intercede, and to, and to reconnect with that walk, there's some property that's going to start to get rain. And they're not going to get flooded out either. It's going to be they're going to get rain when nobody gets rain, and they're not going to get flooded when everybody gets flooded, that their, their, their stuff's not going to tear apart when everybody else's stuff is tearing apart. They're going to walk away when there were shootings in the area. Either God diverted them from where the shooting was going to happen when they were supposed to be there, or they can be in the midst of the shooting and walk away unharmed. I mean, with what went on this week, and see, that guys, that's just the tip of the iceberg. I know what's coming. In fact, there, there are, you know, Mary and I have not only had to deal with the cult, we've had to deal with mind control issues, different things, and that has a smack of what's called the dark awakening or the black awakening as a chosen one. And uh, I'm sure that people like Russ Dizdar and others are all over it, and I'll let them worry about that. But I, I, I see the, the, the makings of certain things, maybe some going off early for God to give warning. What's going to make the difference is not our culture, it's our walk. It's not being culturally compliant, it's being kingdom compliant. Walking in the commandments, walking in the presence of God, walking with Him day and letting Him correct me and to teach me every day. And it's not just to teach me so that I can share, it's to teach me so that I can do you know, some of us, especially men, one of the pressures in our culture is to come up and agree with the silence of Adam. We just don't do nothing. There's a lot of pressure to keep us down. You know what? As we start walking with God, we're going to have a freedom to begin functioning like we have never had before because there, were, there, was, there was an oppression over this nation to press down the men and to elevate women so that Jezebel could rise up. Women are going to get set free. And I tell you, when men begin to function the way that God created them, the one who's going to get the happiest is the wife. Uh, Mary, Mary will tell, share this with you because uh, I tell her, she'll confirm. There are times that she has prayed for two or three hours and got something done. 
And I finally got up off my blessed assurance and prayed for a minute and a half, and I got it done too. Because it, it goes with male headship. And I've learned that when that pressure begins to come on me, I begin standing against that pressure and said, you ain't putting Jack in the box anymore. <laughs> no, -uh. you're not pushing me down anymore. You try to push me down, you're going to get surprised. Devil. I'm not going to be pushed anymore. Jesus set me free not to push me down, but so that I could be released to function in the kingdom of God, to walk with God and to move with authority, to move with purpose, to hear God. The twofold purpose, guys, of biblical life are teach people how to walk with God and to facilitate the removal of all obstacles in your life that hinder the walk. And so when people, I, I've had people say, I love your teaching, but just all hell breaks loose every time I listen to it. Yeah, all your hindrances become to the surface so that you can get rid of them. All the things that you thought you had suppressed and that you thought you had you know, controlled actually had you corralled and you didn't know it. And then all of a sudden, all your dogs start barking. <laughs> God is saying, whether it's a wound, whether it's a bad habit, whether it's a, a false concept. Uh, guys, I've had people email me and say, I love you and I hate you to death. At least I'm not leaving them ambivalent, you know. <laughs> because there's, there's an anointing here for all the things to come up. So God wants to get rid of the obstacles. And there are things that we may do different. Even, even like with, with, uh, with, you know, praying over a meal. How many know it's biblical to bless God after the meal? And everybody should do that when you're full, thank God. But by Jesus' time, they had gotten into giving the blessing before the meal. Jesus never corrected that. But I, I guarantee you, if there are the rabbis, and I, I know some rabbis that I've showed what we know. You know, we used to have to just worry about eating things, sacrificed to idols. I mean, even Jesus had a problem with that when you read the seven uh, churches in the book of Revelation. I got the don't eat things, sacrificed to idols. They don't do that anymore. But the occult have placed people within the food industry that curse food. We've ministered to some of them that would work at restaurants or work in food processing plants, that they constantly curse the food specifically for it to land on Christians, to destroy families, to destroy health. And so when, when Mary and I pray, we add things to our prayer because we have knowledge. Not because we're something special. We just, we just kind of stumbled across. How I many know that if you're, if you're eating cursed food, it might be a good thing to break the curse when you're praying over the food? And uh, I, I've, I've been asked to pray over food. You know, Lord, in the name of Jesus, we just ask that you take this food, you bless it, to nourish more of our body. Father, we thank you. We praise you for your provision. We honor your name, and we break every curse. And everybody goes, I don't want some witch's curse somewhere in the food industry line landing on me because I didn't address it. Now, I may have gotten away with it before I knew. Maybe. But now that I know, I'm required to walk in what I know. And so there are things that we do different because we, we understand warfare. I want to build David's mighty men in this last day. It's, I, I, I am not interested, and I'm putting everybody on notice, I'm not interested in building a large congregation. I'm about building people. Because in a couple years, what happens if we can't have a congregation? Has that ever happened before? What happens? You better learn how to walk with God at home. And you better learn how to be walking with God for yourself. And I, I want my, my heart is to build up men and women that know how to walk with God in church and out of church. And what God is doing that you express here better be continuing after you leave because that's where it's really going to matter. Guys, and, and we need to understand some things. The, the walk, and there are two things that we really try to stress here. One of them is during praise and worship, I want you confronted with the presence of God. Mary and I aren't happy unless the Holy Spirit shows up real strong because that's one of the first things that have to happen. It's got to start with Jesus and the manifested presence of God. And for you to begin developing your walk with God, we're going to get these in, in, uh, over the next couple of weeks. It starts with the blood of Jesus. If it doesn't start there, you're not going anywhere. You're not going anywhere. The blood of Jesus and the name of Jesus. 
It's got to start there. There is no other name which men might be saved. How many know that Jews begin getting completed in Messiah in the book of Acts? And it's still the only way that they can get completed is in Jesus. The only way that an old Gentile can begin walking with God is by the blood of Jesus. The blood of Jesus has got to cover the sins and they've got to be born again. And having the name is not a magical way of ending your prayers that God now has got to do what you ask. You've got to walk worthy of the name. That's what I mean by the name of Jesus. I've got to walk worthy of his blood and I've got to walk worthy of his name and then I get to the spirit of God. After that, I get into the armor of God. Then you go to the commandments. Now, in the garden, we see several different things happen. Adam was introduced, the very first thing as he, as he became aware, as God created him, the, whole, the God breathed the Spirit into him. So the first thing that Adam was confronted with was the Holy Spirit. You can't be born again unless the Holy Spirit comes in you and causes you to be born again, just like even Adam was in the garden. And then Adam was given commandments, but because of the fall, we've got to have the blood of Jesus, the name of Jesus, the Spirit of God, the armor of God, and then the commandments. Because if you don't do it in that order, you can show up on the battlefield keeping the commandments and be wearing your BVDs. And how many know that when you're confronting the enemy, you better be wearing the armor of God? And so we're going to begin getting our walk right. I've been dealing with paths to walk, and we've discovered the commandments. But I'm going to take the time to show you why the blood of Jesus. We have so many believers that don't know. They, they, they cry over the cross. They're brokenhearted over the cross. They just can't tell you why God had to do it. And if you don't know why, then you can accept the lie. Well, there are many ways to heaven. No, there's not. There's one. Uno. <laughs> one. There is no other name in heaven and earth that men might be saved. You're going to find that out next week because, guys, we've got to get the walk right. Now, in that walk, are we going to have he Hebraic expression? Absolutely. We're also going to have some charismatic expression because what I see in the book of Acts is a charismatic Hebraic church. We have to have that. But I don't want that without the walk. I don't want that as a show that we put on here and then go home and don't live it day in and day out. You can hear from God just as clear as home as you can here. You can be touched by God just as clear at home as you can here. You can praise God just as powerfully at home as you can here. But when you do it all week, it flows naturally from here. That, that's, that's my heart's desire. That's my passion. That's why we do some things different. I don't want to rely just on culture. I want the culture of biblical life to be a passion for God, his presence, to walk with him, and to begin doing things out of a heart reality. That I do what I do because I'm walking with him and I'm so sensitive to him, I'm not going to do anything to cause him to back away from me. I get that. Then if you walk into a disaster zone, God just walked in with you. There's where Psalms 91 begins to take its stance. God walked in with you. A thousand can fall by your right side, 10,000 by your right hand, yet it will not come with you. Only with your eyes will you see. Why? Because you're walking with God. I'm going to end with this. To just show you the grace of God. Now, I've shared this before, but... Mary and I, when we were, we were dealing with the occult, we've had assassins come after us. We've had them sabotage our vehicles. And they, the, the occult really love to use accidents to take people out. They consider it a human sacrifice when they do that. It's just, as, it's just as valid to them as if they put you on an altar and they drove a stake through your heart. And so we, we knew there was a heightened occult activity, and we ended up having to go to Jeff City. So we decided to take a, a back route instead of the one that they were expecting us to do. And we're coming up this road, and there's a big ditch on both sides, and then cow pasture, but you had to jump like a, what was it, about a 10-foot ditch. How many know that's not very good in a minivan? You can't do that. I'm not a speed racer, okay? And there's a semi coming that loses control, and it's all over the road, and it's now on our side of the road. And Mary's praying, and I'm trying to pray, and I'm trying to calculate, I think I can make that ditch. 
And Steffi will tell you this because, I mean, she was there. Our kids were there. It was literally like a hand reached down and picked up that semi like it was a Tonka truck and set it back on the right side of the road and straightened it up. And as we drove by, the only one with more of a surprise, a shock on his face was the driver. Because I thought, he thought, I'm going to kill these people. There's no way I can get this truck under control. And God just picked it up and set it back. You see, that? that's what I'm talking about. That's what I want you to have if the devil tries to kill you. I want you to be able to say, God delivered me. God took me on the other side. What the devil meant for bad, God made for good. And now I have a testimony of the sovereignty and the power of God. That's what I want in your life. That's what I want. That's why I, I give this stuff away. We put our stuff on. I, I almost work 24-7, it seems like to me sometimes. Just, I feel like the dunk, got to get the video out. Okay, I got the video out. Got to get it uploaded, get it uploaded. We, we go through several hundred DVDs a month mailing them out to people. Just whatever we need to do to get the word out because I want people, I know what's coming, and if they don't get it, if they don't get it, they're going to be a casualty of this war, and they're, they're going to lean on their culture. They're going to lean on their traditions, and they're going to be found one lacking because they're not walking with God. They have been convinced that culture is spirituality. Guys, I don't want that. I want a, a people that are hard to kill. That every time we show up, we like Jesus, we go about doing good and destroying all the wicked works of the enemy. That's what I want, not just in those in the fivefold ministry. I want the whole body like that. I'm longing for a day that I can send Troy down to the hospital and he just clears it out. Because God moves on him and, and he can begin praying for people. Or Ben or any of you. This is not a preacher thing. It's a body of Christ thing. And if we get walking with God the way that we're supposed to, what we see in the book of Acts can begin happening through all of us now. I'm counting on it for me. I'm counting on it for you. Because all the foodstuffs and then all the weapons and all those things won't do it in what's ahead. The greatest weapon is the name of Jesus. It can make a 155 howitzer miss the mark. It can make MX missiles go the other way. I've had testimony that I've heard firsthand of believers that were sneaking Bibles into communist Germany, in East Germany, that the guards sicked German shepherds that were trained killers on them and they began saying in English, the name of Jesus, the name of Jesus. And those German shepherds began to bow down. Begin to whine and saying, I can't attack this one. I, I, I know, Master, you want me to attack. I, I can't attack them. You don't see the angel that's standing next to them. I ain't touching that. You may be stupid enough to try, but I see what's there, and I'm not touching it. That's what I want in your lives. I wake up nights praying, saying, God, give me what it takes. Give me what it takes to, to communicate this and the need for it and to bring the reality of it into people's lives. And the reason why I teach on the Hebraic heritage is because it's true. <laughs> it's true. It's a powerful thing when you walk with God that the church has missed. It's not just to start a little messianic congregation. Those are all over the place. I got my eye on the real prize, the people of God. God is going to have a remnant in America. And when Jesus comes back, my heart's cry is that the United States of America will be a sheep nation. Oh, Antichrist, you take this stuff back over to Europe where it belongs. You take it over to the Middle East. You take it over to Europe where it belongs. But I want people here saying, I'll not bow my knee. I mean, maybe like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. But I refuse to bow my knee because I walk with God. And guys, even if the worst, even if you become a martyr by doing that, if I'm going to die, I'm going to die not bowing the knee. You may call that the old soldier in me. 
I'm holding the line. I will not bow the knee. And if I'm going to die, I'm going to die by being faithful. By being faithful to him. That's where we're headed. That, that's, that's why we do what we do. Father, I come before you this morning in the name of Jesus. And Father, I ask that the anointing would overcome my ability sometimes to communicate that which you have shown me, Father. And that the Holy Spirit would bear witness to the truth of what I'm saying today. And Father, I just ask for a, a new level of anointing to be released in everyone who hears this. That every obstacle that keeps them from walking from you begins to be systematically removed from their life by the power of the Holy Spirit. And Father, enable the walk. Father, power the walk. That all of them will know how to walk with you and how to move heaven. And how to bring hell to its knees, I ask. Father, I thank you and I praise you for it. I trust heaven to bring it to pass. In Jesus' name.